expanded archery opportunities or antlerless harvest opportunities aren't necessarily appropriate. Um, generally speaking, in places where we do feel that that antlerless harvest is already adequate, those are places that have a low overall deer density and archers and people that are harvesting antlerless deer generally tend to distribute themselves where deer are more populous. Uh, so this results in these areas generally having a low total archery harvest and a low archery antlerless harvest. So in places where we are concerned about the potential for uh, increased antlerless harvest not helping us meet our management objectives, uh, those concerns are somewhat self uh, regulated as these are um, again places with low deer densities and low harvest um, as it presently is. There are areas where we think increased animalist harvest may be beneficial. These are generally productive deer habitats. These are um, places that also experience a lot of issues with invasive species and browse damage which uh, limits your ability to maintain a working landscape and has a cascading effect uh, of reducing uh, the amount of timber management occurring on the landscape. Uh, and there's also hunter access limitations that uh, may warrant a uh, you know step back in terms of how we do things. For instance, in KN, and again, this year we'll have uh, somewhere in the vicinity of almost 2,000 unallocated permits in both those units. Uh, at some point, we can give out as many antlerless permits as we want, but if we uh, cannot get that harvest in the right places, uh, you know, there's the potential that we over harvest places where hunters have access, and we're not really addressing uh, those pockets of deer where we'd like those uh, additional antlerless deer to be taken. So, uh, if there are things we can do uh, to more evenly distribute that harvest or make it more equitable, uh, those uh, and increase it, uh, those would be beneficial. Uh, so I want to start by talking about the youth season. Vermont is a very successful uh, youth season, both in terms of the number of youth that partake and their overall harvest, even compared to states that are much larger. 2007, the department did a survey on this. Generally speaking, youths participate less than three years. About 60% only participate for two years. Um, and 87% of hunters support uh, youth hunting opportunities particularly for deer and they do so even if they perceive these as having a negative impact on uh, their ability to harvest the deer following the youth season. And at some point in 2007, just uh, less than half, about six years after youth season was implemented, about 40% of hunters had either partaken in a youth hunt by being the mentor or the mentoree. Um, so, uh, there's generally support for youth season and high participation. <clears throat> the archery season, so uh, as I mentioned, there are places where we feel the additional harvest of antlerless deer would be beneficial, and so the timing of the season can be very important in how you achieve that. Right now, uh, if you've been out in the woods, you'll notice deer are starting to shift off their summer patterns. Uh, so providing archery hunting opportunities earlier in the year uh, would allow potentially for uh, the increased harvest of antlerless deer and a more even uh, distribution of that harvest across the landscape. When deer are dispersed on their summer range, that's when they're the uh, most evenly distributed across the landscape. And many places in Vermont are a good summer range, and as uh, deer start to shift onto their fall and winter ranges, we see um, you know them shift uh, their utilization of the landscape uh, in ways that don't always make them. Uh, more vulnerable to more hunters. So uh, the timing of the season opening up earlier can allow hunters uh, the opportunity to harvest more antlerless deer uh, earlier in the year and the potential for that to be more evenly distributed across the landscape. Uh, there's uh, also the benefit of increased hunter recruitment uh, and participation. A lot of research suggests uh, that those things increase with opportunity. Um, Adam, so, yes. Is there a problem with having the bow season stretch in overlap other seasons, like our neighboring state, Hampshire, has a 75-day archery season, during which time you could just buy that 75-day archery license as an out-of-state or hunt the whole thing. Right, so I think those are you know, something that the Colonel could speak to. Um, from my perspective, I can tell you that that could also be used to perhaps better manage our animals harvest. For example, if uh, there's an early muzzleloader season where you need a WMU specific permit to be hunting, archery season could be open in those units because theoretically that's where uh, we want more handleless harvest. And so that could be uh, used as a means of, of better managing 
seen our, our analyst harvest, but again, it'll come down to specific law enforcement considerations over what that overlap is. So, uh, as I mentioned, the increased archery expansion has the, uh, if done uh, in the right way, has the opportunity to more evenly distribute um, the harvest. If you have more uh, days available to hunt, your uh, probability of encountering favorable conditions increases, no matter what you consider favorable. Uh, it's increased ability to manage antlerless deer uh, and, and increased hunter recruitment and retention. Again, uh, we've seen a change in who our deer hunters are and um, the youth and the new non hunters that we recruit. Uh, generally partake in a more diverse set of deer hunting opportunities, specifically archery. And so it's intuitive to believe that providing more of that type of opportunity would be appealing to that uh, demographic. There's also, if you're uh, expanding archery opportunities, options for expanded crossbow opportunities. How can those be uh, incorporated into um, what you're trying to accomplish? And that would be especially effective, we'll talk about it in a second, at likely retain our hunters that we have. So uh, we asked hunters uh, their age in the survey, and of those, uh, so all respondents are the stash line, and the dark line is those that hunted archery in the previous year. And what we can see is generally our archers are somewhat of a younger crowd. Uh, so that would mean that expansion of crossbow opportunities um, for these could act as an effective retention tool uh, at keeping these hunters in the sport for a longer period of time. We, we should credit uh, Roy Kilburn for stimulating that data set. Okay. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you can't talk. Of it. <laughs> 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 we, I thank you for stimulating the uh, cross tabs to get that data. If you remember that. Uh, no, it's Paul Perfect. You uh, <laughs> 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 catch me off guard I'll catch every you single time. <laughs> 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 we'll see an Adam Roy, Roy. How's that? That's what yeah. I'm trying to do. So, with an interest in uh, increasing recruitment, retention, and better antlerless <coughs> harvest, we asked hunters if they would support our pose, making the archery season longer. The dash line is uh, combined all responses. The dark line is those that hunted archery, uh, and this gray line, or these gray lines, are those that did not. The bars, I suppose. Uh, but what we can see is that your support or opposition to expanded archery season seems largely contingent upon whether or not you are an archer. And one thing that we noticed in the deer hunter survey is generally when hunters perceive something as um, potentially having a negative impact on their uh, perceived opportunity that they were in opposition to that. So uh, opposition to things may not be theoretically uh, opposed to what's being asked, but more of a general opposition to the idea of someone having a uh, disproportionate opportunity before um, they did it. But anyway, uh, so uh, we did ask uh, about crossbows. This is from the Duda survey. Uh, hunters did not seem uh, supportive of broad legalization, although uh, they did appear to be very supportive of expanding these opportunities for older age hunters. Uh, we did tell them what uh, older meant, because um, that's apparently contingent upon your current age, what you perceive as older. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so we did ask, at what age should older hunters be able to hunt with a crossbow? And apparently old is about 60, so. Um, <laughs> don't know. I was like, this is 50, so as long as it goes. Uh, yeah, so anyway, so I guess, you know, there's that. Uh, so we did ask some questions about muzzleloader season. Um, in 2010, we asked hunters if they would support an early muzzleloader season if it was antlerless only by permit. 59% um, of hunters said they would support um, such a season if it helped us meet our objectives. The mean respondent age in that survey was 47. Our uh, survey mean age was about 50 in the last survey we did, and earlier surveys in 1998 suggest a lower age than that. So we've been um, watching our hunters' age as we've been conducting surveys throughout um, the years. In the last survey that we did, we asked a more general question, specifically relating to their broad support for an early muzzleloader season without specifying if that was for antler or antler list year in combination. Uh, what we can see is that hunters are about evenly divided on their support and opposition for such a season. 
um, and about 50%, just over 50% of hunters uh, indicated that they hunt during uh, the muzzleloader season typically. So an early season prior to the November rifle season allows for the earliest harvest of antlerless deer, as I mentioned earlier this evening. Uh, such a season could likely be held into the first, uh, potentially into the second week in November, and still <coughs> allow for uh, the harvest of antlerless deer prior to uh, you know, great increases in breeding activity. Um, and again, as uh, the year progresses, deer become more and more concentrated on their fall and winter ranges, and having antlerless harvest opportunities earlier um, theoretically allows you to more evenly distribute um, the harvest across the landscape, and uh, it increases your hunting opportunity potentially, although uh, that's largely contingent upon other season structures and regulations and um, how those are anticipated to impact the uh, harvest. So um, antlerless only, again, uh, could be used to reduce pressure on bucks through the fact that it's an antlerless only season or is done in conjunction with some type of bag limits or regulations um, that influence uh, the ability to pursue bucks. So again, uh, just like we do currently and like was suggested with the buck population, the permit system is the most precise means of managing your deer population, the most um, precise method of achieving your objective, and so it's highly recommended that such a system remain in place. Uh, and the expanded antlers harvest may mitigate concerns over unallocated permits through reduced permit numbers. So uh, if there's an additional early antlerless muzzleloader season, it's likely to think permit success would increase, which would directly reduce the number of permits issued annually uh, and reduce some of our concerns we have with unallocated permits and where those are being utilized or where hunters are not able to get access to. Um, and more targeted uh, archery antlerless harvest um, could occur, as I mentioned, with a early muzzleloader season to, again, uh, more focus our, our desired antlerless harvest into particular regions of WVUs. Uh, so we also asked, and, and this is kind of uh, something that we ended the working groups with, the questions on <coughs> protecting the health of Vermont's deer herd. One thing that we've heard from hunters and the working group members uh, is that keeping Vermont's deer healthy and making sure that our regulations are uh, you know, in the best long-term interest of Vermont's deer is something that hunters seem uh, to have great consensus on. And one of these things that could potentially uh, provide a risk to Vermont's deer herd is the use of deer urine. These are things that are produced in captive facilities, uh, the main spread of, of chronic wasting disease and, and other concerns um, that we have. So um, we asked hunters uh, if they used uh, these types of lures while hunting. Um, about 20% of them did in the online survey we did. Well over a third indicated they had used these in the previous year. Um, and so then we asked hunters, uh, with them knowing that this may increase the risk for disease introduction, if they would support a ban on these types of um, lures. And we can see that hunters are uh, supportive of such managers, which is um, good. So, Adam, not to interrupt you, but going back to that question, um, uh, Aaron, um, is there any sort of regulatory uh, body or anybody regulating these Three Canadian provinces have bans on their either their use or their possession while afield or while hunting. No, I mean on the producers of this oh, product. Is there anybody overseeing <coughs> what's being produced, where it's coming from, and the facilities themselves? Current federal regulations regarding the captive deer industry are not sufficient to stop the spread of diseases that are a concern to wildlife populations. So, no. <laughs> yes, yeah, but we, they are not sufficient. So are they physically checking these this That's stuff for CWD before it like leaves the production line? No. At best, they are saying that their urine products come from a CWD monitor program. However, federal monitoring regulations are not sufficient uh, to stop the spread or early detection of the disease before uh, it would be distributed and then redistributed out across the landscape. It's my, and we can weigh in on this, as well. I don't mean to interrupt you here, but this is, I think, an important issue. We talked about this. Sean uh, Haskell brought this up to us five years ago, I'm going to say. 
and it was concern he had then, you know, looking towards the future. It's as much a concern now, I think, and even the increased knowledge I have of the lack of regulation, which is what I was getting at, that we don't know where this stuff is coming from or where it is. I would be supportive of the department uh, as part of their uh, proposal, some sort of regulation uh, on this the prohibition of this product. And I don't know what the rest of the board thinks, but... Um, I'd be right there to say that we should take that on as a separate issue uh, immediately and get it done. Uh, I think it should be separate and, and done outside of this whole right. conference. It would be a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I agree. Yeah. This, okay, so from this, there's wide consensus on the board, I would say. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. That <coughs> perhaps we, the department should uh, move forward with the regulations. Would, would you push for the ban and the sale? Because... You we know, can't control you, the sale. No, you, 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 we've got a lot of things we're not supposed to use in the state, I, and you know we can. You go to Dick's, you go to the Deer Hill stores, stores the Premier Deer is available and Dick's statewide, yeah. but yeah. it's not able to use. So all yeah. we can control is the <coughs> use, use of the product. Yes. But that's where our authority ends. Yeah. And but we still it doesn't mean we because it's out there for sale in, in the various department stores that we <coughs> should give up on the item. You know. If we think it's an important, could, uh, could we enforce it to? Well, I guess that'd be catch twenty two. If you sell hunting licenses, you can't sell banned products. No, we have we no like that. No authority on merchandising. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Catherine. We have no authority on merchandising in any way, shape, or form. Only the use of the product itself, okay. while a field mm -hmm. for hunting. Okay. Correct. Yes. So. Um, it might not eliminate it 100%. No, it's, it's not still available, but we would have a major impact on, you know, on the I think so. And also, there would be uh, value in the educational value to right. the hunting population that this product does pose a threat. Um, so, us moving forward with the regulation would would help to regulate or help to educate the hunting population that you know it's, it's a product we probably don't want on our landscape. Brian, just yes. a clarification here. Is, is at this point, we made a distinction between the natural based urine versus synthetic. I'm talking specifically natural urine and okay. authentic <laughs> urine, not synthetic. In fact, this would push more towards the synthetics, which is where I think, am I correct in saying that the synthetics pose little to no threat to our? I, I mean, yeah, I suppose, yeah, that's true. Okay. Um, so, uh, I guess I'll make a formal request to the department to Got it. consider drafting some type of uh, language for the consideration. I'm sorry, Adam, you can continue, but I wanted to get that. Oh, anything else? <laughs> <laughs>